Well, hello, this is Dean Tenney. I'm coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. We always like to provide in the playlist for the various uh, series, uh, narrative lectures, as well as explication of the test specification as published by Fender or NASA, as well as a uh, practice test or two or three or four. And uh, it's time to circle back and show our SIE test takers some love with a practice test for them. We've been uh, building out the channel over the last 12 months and I've uh, been busy with 65, 66 content that's almost complete. And thought I'd circle back and uh, provide a uh, practice uh, final uh, for the SIE. This is, I think, take two or three. Um, I was in a rush in the last take and um, there's a pause button and I, why am I moving so fast? Because the I looked at the the SIE FINRA practice test I explicated, and it was like an hour and a half, a little, I think, over. And I looked at this one, it was an hour, and I thought, man, I was going too quick. Um, so I'm going to slow it down a little bit. Uh, I'm going to do uh, a little more explication than I did in that first one. And then I'll post this, and I'll uh, delete the one that's up there now. As much as I hate giving up the, the view count. <laughs> so uh, like, share, uh, subscribe. <clears throat> And uh, like I said, we'll, we'll do a better job on this explication a little more, build this out a little bit better. Okay, so uh, when I created this practice museum, what I did was kind of try and come up with a riff on the uh, uh, FINRA practice test with mirror questions or kind of the opposite or that come from debriefs. That was kind of my intent in this uh, explication. Uh, to be a beneficiary of an ABLE account, you are gonna get a question, high probability. All about probabilities on the ABLE account on your SIE and on debrief, uh, it seems what they're asking for is this before the age of 26. So the answer is, let me get out my annotation tool. Let me get a color here. Now I've tried to uh, provide distractors that could have been right answers to different questions. So for example, the age of ma majority 18 or 21, depending on the state, is the wrong answer here, but that would have been the right answer to age of majority in a uniform gift to minors act. Uh, B would have been the right answer to the age that we can stipulate in a uniform transfer to minors act. This is not an account but about UGMA or UPMA. So the answer is C. Uh, during the cooling off period. So if you're gonna sell brand new securities to the public, you're gonna make a registration statement with the SEC assuming you're not an exempt issuer or assuming it's not an exempt transaction. And once you make that registration statement with the SEC, you enter into the cooling off period or quiet time, which is a minimum of 20 days. If we did not have this cooling off period or quiet time, I'd be calling you every day saying, hey, this thing's gonna be hot. You know what IPO stands for, don't you? Instant profit opportunity. So if you call me uh, as a broker and our firm is one of the uh, participants in this underwriting, and you say, hey, Dean, I uh, saw that you guys are underwriting the security, you're doing the IPO, uh, I'm interested. I said, well, let me send you out a preliminary prospectus, also known as a red herring. Very important to know that that has pretty much everything you need to do to uh, know to make uh, a decision, except it does not include the file offering price. And so that's one of the major testable distinctions between a preliminary prospectus known as red herring and the final prospectus. Now, based on that, I can accept non-binding indications of interest. And that's very testable that indications of interest are non-binding on all uh, parties. We're not allowed to advertise the new issue, but the SEC has been kind enough to say that the tombstone is not an advertisement of the security. A tombstone if you want a graveyard, it says, you know, when they were born, when they died, loving father, husband. For more complete information, see the obituary. And a tombstone for a securities offering is very similar. It says, this is neither an offer to sell nor solicitation to buy the following securities. An offering is made only by a copy of the prospectus. Read it carefully. Do not send any money. And so uh, we can place that tombstone. Um, a lot of bankers then put that tombstone in loose site and they uh, use it as the trophies of their deals. Uh, I have uh, been contemplating and trying to get to uh, figure out how to do this. Uh, I'm in the middle of a sequence with the SIE series seven and 66. I'm gonna uh, put a loose site tombstone 
for those participants who uh, pull off the registration hat trick and get that all done. The keyword that makes D the appropriate answer here is the accept and then this word binding. And that's why that is a no, big no-no. I can't tell you how many firms get in trouble trying to figure out some way <laughs> to make this other than what it is, which is non-binding. Uh, which of the following is a primary transaction? You're going to get high probability about the distinction between primary transactions where the issuer receives the proceeds and a uh, secondary transaction where the previous owner receives the proceeds. I particularly like my version of this question because I've uh, put a lot of uh, meat on the bone, so to speak, in this question. Uh, primary transaction, a New York Stock Exchange listed stock trade in the third market. What is the third market? The third market can best be characterized as listed securities traded over the counter. That's what the third market is. So if, for example, Twitter is a New York Stock Exchange listed stock. So any trade in a Twitter that takes place elsewhere away from New York is a third market trade, but it's still a secondary transaction. A NASDAQ stock traded directly between institutions in the fourth market. The fourth market can best be characterized as direct trading between institutions. So uh, Tesla is a NASDAQ stock. If uh, BlackRock has a 10, 10 million share block and they wanna sell that to T. Rowe Price, another institutional investor, that would be a fourth market trade. That's still a secondary transaction, but that's a trade between two institutions and that's called the fourth market. A qualified institutional buyer of securities. Keyword buys newly issued stock in a private investment. Private meaning the stock that the qualified institutional buyer is buying in this public company is unregistered. You know, and what typically happens here is that the institutional, the Quib, actually, you know, will hold that uh, six months, get it registered, and hopefully they can provide this quick financing to the publicly held company. Now, I would know this term, that's called a pipe. And I would know that a pipe stands for a private investment and a public company. Now it doesn't have to be a quid, but that's the one that uh, is high probability on the test where an institutional investor says to the publicly traded company, hey, we'd be willing to buy some uh, stock that you could issue to us that is unregistered. And that's called a pipe. I would definitely know that a qualified institutional buyer under 144A, and I have a couple of questions on that, is a uh, institutional investor with $100 million or more in assets under management. And what they're allowed to do is buy unregistered domestic securities, as we see here, and unregistered uh, foreign securities as well. D, an insurance company, I probably should fix that slide, let me fix that. An insurance company, I appreciate your patience. Sometimes I doing these things the first time, every once in a while I have a brain fart or a typo. And like I say, I think this is take two or three on this, uh, this explication. Anyways, an insurance company like Prudential sells bonds out of its general account to another insurance company uh, like Allstate. Uh, again, that's a direct trade between institutions, but that is not a uh, primary transaction. So the answer here is C, whoop. And I do think, whoop, 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 whoop. I, I do think that's definitely high risk on your exam. A registered rep sells an investment not sponsored by their broker dealer without permission. So, you know, broker dealers have what's called an approved product list, and uh, you're not supposed to get people involved in investment opportunities that aren't on the approved product list. You know, the proper process here would be if you want to get people involved is for that uh, sponsor to get on the approved product list so the broker dealers can sell it. That's called a selling agreement. So this is uh, an investment where there is no selling agreement with the broker dealer and you didn't get the uh, permission you were supposed to. And that's very much a prohibited practice. And that is known as selling away. You know, backing away, I think I've got a uh, practice question for that as well. Backing away is when a market maker fails to honor a firm quote. And that too is a prohibited practice, it just isn't this one. Interpositioning is putting a third party into a trade. You know, and that may or may not be a violation depending on the context. And then front running is a big no-no, that's trading ahead of your customers and that's a big no-no as well. Uh, which of the following is responsible for protecting investor residents of a particular state 
and may require the broker dealer, the associated persons and securities to be registered in the state. Now, I would imagine that most of you, this is the first leg of your testing journey. And what I mean by that is you're going to be uh, taking another exam. Uh, you're either going to be taking, my guess would be a series 63 or a series uh, 66. And that's called the Uniform Securities Act. The state administrators have been kind enough to say, the North American Securities Administrator Association, that if you get tested on the U Uniform Securities Act template, they will allow you to conduct business in the state. So you have, again, a couple more tests in your future. I would imagine most of you are going to take your SIE, which does not require sponsorship, then take your Series 6 or 7 top off, and then A63 or 66. If you're taking the 63, that means you're just going to be an agent of the broker dealer. If you're taking a 66, uh, well, maybe some of you are going to take a 663, 65. Ugh, you know. Anyways, uh, the 66 allows you to be both an agent of the broker dealer an investment advisor representative of the affiliated investment advisory firm. Which of the following is least exposed to inflationary risk? Now, you know, here I got two stocks and uh, the utility stock and the blue chip stock. Blue chip stocks are stocks that have a proven track record in good times and bad. And please note, they pass on any uh, inflation they experience to their customers. Uh, I'm coming to you just after McDonald's uh, has reported its earnings, and McDonald's says the inflation that it's experiencing is being passed through the customers, and they are paying, so it didn't affect their earnings as much. You should definitely know this doesn't uh, help you out. I mean, that would be the most exposed. And then, you know, I kind of tried to give you a little 50-50 here between these two, but the blue chip stock is going to be better than the utility stock. Utility stocks, you know, um, don't raise their dividends as much. Uh, they can raise their prices, but given those two, uh, D is the more appropriate answer. All the following are true of a 529 plan, except very high probability that you're going to get a question on your SIE where you're required to contrast a 529 with a Coverdale. So I highly recommend when you're watching these explications that you have a notepad or four by six card or three by five card and you take notes about things you might want to uh, revisit after watching the explication. That $2,000 is for a Coverdale and not a 529. So, you know, the 529 allows you to put more money aside. Uh, pen penalties for trading on material non-public information are both civil, that means write a check, and criminal, go to jail. Now, the civil penalties I would know are three times the profit made or losses avoided. It's, there's no such thing as the AML Act. I just made that up. There's no such thing as that. 33, now 33 is the Prospectus or Paper Act. SIPC is what protects you if a bank, uh, if a broker dealer gets shut down and we can't find your stuff. And then there it is, the Insider Trading Act of 1988. Now, all broker dealers are required in their written supervisory procedures to have a section on insider trading have a section on insider trading. Under industry regulations, like all this stupid but testable, it shows up on everything. It shows up on the SIE, it shows up on the Series 7, it shows up on the Series 24. And under industry regulations or the SROs, the Self-Regulatory Organization, either FINRA or New York, we have a minimum of $2,000. Now, there's a potential of three potential test uh, tricks here on your SIE exam. Uh, by the way, you filed away. You know, I should say this, the more you invest in passing the SIE, the better that you're gonna be in your next leg of your testing journey, whether that be a series six. I think with the appropriate work, you could probably you know, almost pass out of a six with top off with the SIE if you do the right work. And then seven as well, there'll be a lot more depth, a lot more performance opportunities, but this shows up on all of them. Now, the first version of this trick is somebody buys less than $2,000. So the trick here is why would you want to give me $2,000 in a margin account to buy $1,800 worth of stock? So less than $2,000, we're just gonna ask you to fully pay for that. Now I have the other version of this trick as well. And that's where a customer buys between two grand and four grand, in which case the customer is gonna pay two grand. And then after that, there's uh, no trick if he buys, you know, 100 shares at 50. Now, if this was an established margin account, it's not. So you're looking for new account as a national per purchase. If this were an established account, then it would be half, which would be $900.
Uh, which of the following restricts volume that a control person can sell in the public marketplace in any 90 day period? So insiders and affiliates, their immediate family members are called control persons and all the stock they own is called a control stock. And so before they sell, they have to file form 144 and that form 144 is good for 90 days. Oh, I just gave it away, right? <laughs> form 147, 144. Uh, 147 is an interest date offering of security, so it's a wrong answer here, but that could have been a right answer. A Rule 147 interest date offering is a safe harbor under 33. That phraseology is uh, important. So, you know, if you ever talk to an attorney about anything, you say, is there any safe harbors available to me? What you're asking them, is there a way to do what I want to do without running afoul of whatever? Here, running afoul of the Securities Act of 33, and one of those is Rule 147 is a safe harbor or exempt transaction. Reg D is an exempt transaction. Uh, Reg A is an exempt transaction under 33. And so that's what 147 is. It's wrong answer here. Uh, as I said, I'm doing this, I think this is the third take on this. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do a third take is because I don't feel like I what I usually do, which is explicate the distractors which are the technical name for wrong answers. That's what people write tests called wrong answers, distractors. And both on the FINRA exam that I'm kind of mirroring and trying to come up with opposite questions as, aware as, as well as my FINRA you know, practice exams I give you or make for you, uh, I try and come up with some powerful distractors. And a powerful distractor wrong answer is one that's a right answer to a different question. And then we said this would be testable too, right? The 144A is where we find that definition of a qualified institutional buyer of securities you know, again, that definition being they have $100 million in assets under management. Hold, I got to sneeze here in a minute. Uh, okay. Uh, anyways, uh, that would be that definition. And then remember, they can buy unregistered foreign and domestic securities. Yeah. Anyway, so um, which of the following investments is not liquid? Well, in any money market, any mutual fund, I can redeem within seven calendar days and get my check. So mutual funds of any type, including money market funds, are very liquid. A New York Stock Exchange listed stock, I can sell and turn it back into money in T plus two. Same for a NASDAQ stock, very testable, no partnerships. Direct participation programs, also known as partnerships, are not very liquid because they're organized, as I just mentioned, as partnerships. In a partnership, you can't get in or out of the partnership without the permission of the general partner. So securities industry essentials exam, one thing that's essential is the various securities we have in the industry. One of those are direct participation programs known as partnerships, and we don't recommend those to people who need their uh, direct participation programs, so those who need their money to be liquid. All the following are advantages of a mutual fund except. So professional, professional management is certainly an advantage to a mutual fund. This is the easiest way for mo most folks to avail themselves of professional management. This is the easiest way for most folks to avoid selection risk, also known as non-systematic risk. The easiest way to avoid selection risk or non-systematic risk is to diversify. And the easiest way to diversify, again, is in the context of a mutual fund. You know, my favorite quote uh, about diversification, one of them it comes from Bernard Baruch. Bernard Baruch, a red, legendary Wall Street speculator, said money is like manure and you ought to spread it around. And then mutual funds are just easier to own than individual securities. They're just easier. There's lots of things that make a mutual fund easier to own than a portfolio of securities. And then what I was trying to get on this question, I'm not so sure I like my distractor here, but what I'm trying to get at in D, and that's the answer here, is you're still exposed to systematic risk, risks in the system, the tendency of securities prices to move together. So risk prevails despite your diversification. And that's what I was trying to get at. So I'm not quite sure it's one of my favorite uh, questions, but that's what I'm trying to get at. You're still exposed in a mutual fund to systematic risk, risks in the system, the tendency of securities prices to move together. I think it is when bad things happen to good stocks, you know, crash, risk market crashes, the NAV of your mutual fund is probably going to go down as well. A customer invests for the long term. So once I hear long term, I can get rid of the exchange traded fund because the exchange traded fund is more of a trading vehicle 
than it is for somebody who wants to invest long term. The customer does not believe that active management, wow, so adds value. So that means you're not going to pay somebody to try and pick the stocks for you. Adds value and results in unnecessary ta uh, costs and tax, uh, con uh, tax consequences. So, you know, uh, this is kind of a form of what we call the efficient market hypothesis. And if you're willing to accept a market-based return and try and save money in transaction costs and be a little more tax efficient, then the index fund would be for you. Sector fund is diversified, but only within a particular sector or region. And so that would not be the appropriate answer here. All the following are considered municipal securities. So we have the MSRB. You know, the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board uh, publishes rules. That's all they do is publish rules. They publish, you know, A rules, administrative rules. Who cares for test purposes? They publish definitional rules. Who cares for test purposes? They publish G rules, general rules, we care. You know, like G37. And ultimately, if the MSRB says something is a municipal security, well, then it's a municipal security. And so the MSRB has uh, said that local government investment pools, uh, let me get rid of that because it's an except format. Uh, local government investment pools are municipal uh, fund securities. Now, what a local government investment pool is, is where a city, a county, a school district, they pool their resources to uh, buy money market uh, in instruments to get at least a little return on their idle cash. Right? So it's kind of the, the local government's version of a money market fund. Uh, you know, it won't have a prospectus because all municipal fund securities are exempt from 33, including municipal bonds. So we'll have some kind of a disclosure document, but it wouldn't be a prospectus like it would be if it was a money market fund. They have said that 529s are municipal fund securities, and they've said that ABLE accounts are uh, municipal fund securities. Coverdale isn't governed by the MSRB. Coverdale, uh, individual uh, retirement accounts, educational savings accounts are not governed by the MSRB. They don't have authority over those. Uh, which of the following is a debt instrument? Very high probability you're going to get asked about an exchange traded uh, note. You know, when you buy an exchange traded fund, they actually own the underlying assets. You know, they have the assets. If it's a, you know, the spider, they actually own the securities within the exchange traded fund. You know, that's a lot of operational, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, work you got to do, right? So what a sponsor, a financial institution can do is say, instead of actually buying those underlying securities and exchange traded fund, how about we, the financial institution, just tell you, we will pay you uh, based on whatever that equity index or linked, uh, link it to that. And that's what we'll pay you. So for example, if I buy a $100,000 exchange traded note and it's linked to the S&P 500 and the S&P 500 goes up 36%, they would owe me 136 grand. Now, the problem with that is I have a, a risk here, credit risk, because you know, uh, depending on who that financial institution is, will uh, depend on whether they're gonna be able to pay me. Uh, that is very much uh, something you should know. Exchange traded notes have credit risk and they're debt instruments. These other ones are not debt instruments and they don't have a credit risk in terms of the structure. They might have within the portfolio maybe, but not within that. An associated person who is not a registered rep is not permitted to engage in which of the following. So this is my version of trying to come up. People tell me they see questions on the SIE about a pending registration. You know, so this is probably me, you, right? You're getting your SIE. And then you're going to start your study effort on your series six or your series seven. And then you got to take your, you know, 63, uh, 66. And so, you know, what can we uh, have you do as an associated person? Fill out a U4. You've got your U4 filled out, but you haven't uh, uh, been properly registered. You haven't taken on past all your tests and, and, you know, got a, you know, word from the state administrator, you're okay on the state level. So uh, can we have you help in the mailroom? Absolutely. And sending out requested information? Certainly. Uh, can we have you answer the phone and direct calls to the requested parties? Absolutely. Uh, C, can you qualify prospects and make recommendations? So you call up your, your people, your sphere of influence, and you say, hey, I'm still in this process of trying to get all my registrations, but hey, I want to be right out of the gate strong. So let's uh, get together and go over your portfolio and 
talk about what you want to do after I pass my exam. Absolutely not. Right. I say, hey, listen, we're having a seminar. Why don't you call and confirm these people are going to join us this evening? Perfectly OK. Now, I'm not sure how close I am to this pending registration question uh, that people report on debrief, but you'll get something uh, like that. What you're really not supposed to be doing is making public contact and talking about investments. Uh, a stock pays a quarterly dividend of 20 cents. So, you know, you don't have a right to a dividend unless the board declares it. Now, once the board of directors of the company declares that dividend, it becomes a current liability. And at that point, you as a shareholder are entitled to the 20 cents. The current market price is 20. What is the current yield? So you are going to have to do, uh, you know, a couple, you know, calculator problems and you should embrace calculator problems because there is no interpretation of a right answer in a calculator problem. I mean, you either get it right or you get it wrong. Now, one trick we have to pay attention to here is if that's a quarterly dividend, stocks pay quarterly. So that's going to be 80 cents that I'm going to get, you know, and current yield is what an investment pays me by what it costs me. What an investment pays me divided by what it costs me. So now I'm going to get out my calculator and uh, I'm going to take 80 cents uh, divide by 20. And I find out that's 4%. I would be able to do that. And if you can't decide what math to do on the test, uh, do division. If you can't decide what to divide, take the first question and divide it by the second question, uh, first number and divide it by the second number. All the following are stages of money laundering. You know, so again, in our written supervisory procedures of the broker dealer, we're going to have a section on anti money laundering. And we want, uh, you know, our people to be adequately trained to recognize the stages. The first stage of money laundering is placement. I got to have somewhere to put the dirty money. And then the layering is where I mix the dirty money with the clean money. So you can't tell the dirty money anymore. And then I've arrived at my destination, which is uh, integration. You can't tell my dirty money from my uh, clean money. Those are the three steps of money laundering. And then structuring is a different thing. Structuring is a, a tool for a money launderer. Now, and a structuring is when I'm trying to structure transactions to avoid triggering, for example, a CTR. So, you know, instead of showing up with a one cashier's check for 21 grand, I show up with three for seven, so I don't trigger the CTR. Now that would uh, trigger probably a suspicious activity report, but that'd be a different thing, right? So that's not a stage of money laundering. Uh, a market maker fails to honor a firm quote. So I have an example of a quote here in our practice exam. And, you know, I have to honor whatever I told you my size was. Size is I'm good for, you know, 10 by 15. That means I'm good for 10 round lots on my bid. I'm good for 15 round lots on my ask. And you say, hey, Dean, I want to buy 1500. And I go, eh, I changed my mind. Uh, backing away is when a market maker fails on her firm quote. We talked about this one already. Uh, front running is bad. That's trading ahead of customers. That's bad too. Free riding is when a customer buys and sells a security and does not pay for the buy. You know, at some point, if he doesn't pay for the buy, we're going to sell him out and then we're going to freeze his account for 90 days. Going to have no credit privileges. So the answer here is backing away. Uh, which of the following is required for commercially logical transactions? Commercially logical transactions are what we call a red flag. You know, red flags are where we go, hey, man, this doesn't make any commercial sense why they're doing this. You know, and another red flag is they don't seem to be concerned with economics. You know, so uh, what we're going to do is uh, file a suspicious activity report, and we file these with what's called FinCEN. That's where we file SARS and CTRs uh, with. All the following are true of a Uniform Transfer Miners Act account, except now you are going to get tested on an UTMA. So make sure if you're taking notes again, that you make a note. I got to be solid on Uniform Transfer Miner Act accounts for my, you know, my SIE. Now there's no addition, new additional documentation required for this. We don't need to see an attorney or anything. It's going to be the same new account form we use for any other type of an account. But very test will know we're going to use the kids, the miners tax ID. We only have one miner, one custodian per account. A good way to remember that is one on one. You know, we can have multiple donors, but only one miner, one custodian per account. Very testable, no margin. No margin in an up my account. And no, the gift you make is irrevocable. 
a revocal means you can't change it, right? So that's a little different perhaps than, you know, 529 or, you know, where you can change the person on it. It's not, not this. The kid reaches the age of majority, 18 or 21, if we use Uniform Gift to Minors Act, depending on their state, or uh, we can stipulate age 25 on this one. This is the UPMA. And then, you know, we have to re-register the account when they reach whatever that age is to the new, new adult, 18 or 21, or whatever the age was stipulated in the UPMA. Uh, be very, very careful on this one. So, you know, the difference uh, in the test, RTFQ, read the question, full question, is again, whether I'm asking you about somebody who's gifted securities, that's not what's happened here. Because gifted securities is a different answer than cost base of inherited uh, shares. You know, so Dean buys a thousand shares of uh, Apple today at 148. That's 148 grand. And uh, you know, two years later, Dean dies, and the Apple is uh, 178 grand. So uh, the market value, 178 grand, is what uh, is going to be the cost base to my heirs. And that has a thing we call it step up. There's going to be a step up in the cost base. Now, be careful. You know, this would be different if it was a gift. A gift would be the 140. I think I have another version of that, and uh, we'll look at that when we get there. Step up. By the way, same cost base would be the gift. Okay, so uh, we have uh, bonds. You're going to get a couple bond questions. And, you know, it's kind of like learning a foreign language. So they say when you dream a foreign language, that's when you know the foreign language. So ABC is the issuer. Five and a half, 5.50, the five and a half, so that's S. That means this ABC has a coupon, a nominal yield, or a fixed of stated return of five and a half. It matures in 2030, and it's trading at 98. That's 98% of par. I didn't ask you to do this, turn that into dollar price, but that's trading at a discount. And for test purposes, the number one reason that would be trading at a discount is because interest rates have gone up, causing the bond to go down. That's called the inverse relationship. We assume everybody in the securities industry knows the inverse relationship. Interest rates go up, bond prices go down. You know, I joke, if anybody wanna ask you about economics or finance or investments, and you wanna sound smart, you should say it has a lot to do with interest rates. And if you just shut up, you sound good. You know, what about them? They fluctuate. You know, is that good news or bad news? You say it depends. Uh, I like this question. Uh, you are going to get a question like this, high probability. Um, uh, I feel like I did a pretty good job on this question. You should definitely know that American depository receipts have foreign currency risk. You know, what I'm buying, if I buy an American depository receipt, what I'm buying in the U.S. market is in the foreign branch of a domestic U.S. bank and the foreign um, branch, you know, if it's Mexico, Mexico City, or, you know, if it's a Korean company, Seoul, you know, uh, Tokyo, you know, if it's Samsung, you'd buy Samsung as an ADR, that's a Korean company. Uh, Toyota would be a Japanese uh, ADR. I mean, you could buy the Japanese security in the Japanese market if you chose to. Um, not probably a good idea, but anyways, uh, Swiss, uh, maybe Nestle, you buy the ADR for Swiss, uh, Nestle, which is a Swiss company. Uh, I typically, when I'm lecturing, use Telefonos to Mexico. And Telefonos to Mexico is the monopoly phone carrier in Mexico. They're collecting the phone bills in pesos. You have to turn the pesos into dollars. And so they most certainly have currency risk. Now, in a euro bond, I'm typically lending the European company uh, euros, and I expect to be paid back in euros. And that means I have to turn the euros back into dollars. And so indeed I have currency risk. Uh, here I skip the ADR and I just buy the foreign security in the foreign market. And again, I would have a uh, risk that I got to turn that money at some point back into dollars. Ding, 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 ding. The key word here is a euro dollar bond. I'm lending typically a European issuer, US dollars. I expect, expect to be paid back in US dollars. And so that's the one where I don't have any currency risk. Uh, one more thing, when we exchanging, uh, just you know, make sure you know the spot rate on your SIE is whatever the current exchange rate is. They so sometimes just point blank ask you which of the following the spot rate and you'd say the current exchange rate. Uh, husband and wife want to open an account 
where the decedent share will go to their estate or beneficiary. Now, when I was a practitioner, I saw this a lot, perhaps, when it wasn't their first marriage. And so they say, well, listen, something happens. We want to go to the estate or beneficiary. That's going to be joint tenants in common. And what you got to be able to do on the test is contrast that registration with joint tenants with rights or survivorship. So the answer here is A. Uh, here's the other version of the uh, new margin account trick I was telling about that you are going to very high probability and count on your SIE and on your Series 7. Uh, so now we bought 100 shares in new margin account at 30. Again, if this was an existing margin account, that would be correct. But in a new margin account, if you buy between two grand and uh, four grand, you need two grand. So you know, be prepared for that uh, phraseology, initial transaction, new margin account. Be prepared for that. Be prepared for that. The investor owns 100 shares of ABC common stock at the current uh, market price of 60. If ABC conducts a two for one split, so you're going to get two shares for every one share you have presently. I hope you remember me telling you, you're always going to have more shares at a lower price. More shares at a lower price. So you can just simply chop the answer set and say, oh, I need more than 100 shares at something less than 60. You know, if you want to do the math, I don't know why you would, but you could certainly do the math. You could take your calculator, two for one, divide that, whatever that number is, times it by 100, and that would tell you the 200. Then you take the 100 by times 60 and divide your 200 by 60, 6,000, and come up with uh, the, uh, the same answer. I just think it's easier. More shares at a lower price. Now, be careful. It's a reverse split. It would be less shares at a higher price. And the other thing here to know is that there's no change in proportion of ownership. You have twice as many shares, but so does everybody else. A husband and wife want to open an account where the decedent share will go to the surviving spouse. As we said, you got to be able to contrast those two on your SIE exam. So joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Now the decedent share goes to the surviving spouse. And by the way, it doesn't have to be spouses, but you know, that's how it typically shows up on the exam and in, in, in practice. But you know, you can, I have joint tenants with rights of survivorship on mom's account. She certainly doesn't have that on my account, right? But uh, very much a test question. The maximum gift or gratuity an employee of one member firm can give the employee of another member firm. So remember we said your broker dealer is gonna have a selling agreement with various sponsors, distributors, you know, underwriters, people who are selling investments. And, you know, if your firm has uh, my, uh, my product on your approved product list, I work for the distributor of perhaps the mutual fund, let's say. And I'm an associated person of uh, Franklin Templeton Fund Distributors, for example. And Franklin's on your approved product list. You know, my job is to help you sell Franklin funds. And so, you know, uh, I come out and say, hey, listen, why don't you invite your prospects and clients to a seminar this evening? Uh, I'll come talk about professional management, diversification, ease of ownership. You know, I'll pay for the sodas and the pizzas. That's on me. That's no problem. This rule does not apply to normal deductible business activities. Now, Franklin Templeton's a fine firm. I'm just using them because when I was a retail broker, I did a lot of business with them. But, uh, you know, what I'm not supposed to do, let's say it's a wholesaler from another firm, not Franklin. <laughs> and uh, I say, hey, listen, what would it take for you to sell my fund exclusively? And you say, Dean, to the detriment of my firm and its customers, I say, if need be. And I whip out my $100 bills and I start to say, I said, you just tell me when here. Yeah, you know, maybe uh, you had a thousand, you say, hey, Dean, uh, you can stop. I go, cool. Uh, debatable now whether you represent your firm and its clients or whether you represent me in an effort to defraud your firm and its clients. The maximum gift or gratuity that an employee of one member firm can give to the employee of another member firm is $100. Now it doesn't count normal deductible business activities, doesn't count reminder advertising. All the following are Ginny May are tr uh, true, except all the following are true. Ginny May is fully taxable. You know, you're going to get a question on Ginny May. High probability that you're going to get something on your SIE about Ginny May. All government securities are book entry. There is no physical certificate. There is nothing to transfer and ship to you. The government has you the books, or in this case, Ginny May, the government sponsored enterprise has you on the books. They'll send you the appropriate checks at the appropriate time. Ginny May indeed is directly backed by the federal government. 
you should definitely know that the U.S. government and its government-sponsored enterprises are exempt from 33. They're allowed to sell brand new securities to the public without making a registration statement to the SEC. So, uh, by the way, one other thing that kind of weird shows up is in the secondary market, the Ginny Mays trade on what's called the average maturities in the uh, mortgages and the portfolios. I have a separate lecture on a lot of this stuff in the playlist. So if you go to the SIE playlist, there's a, a lecture on Ginny Mays and CMOs. You know, I don't know how much work you want to do to pass the SIE, but if you want to do the work, there's a lot there, a lot there for you. Uh, I've got two versions of this, uh, both versions because it's testable. You know, capitalism without failure is like religion without hell. And so we liquidate the corporation. The most junior position in liquidation is the common stockholders. You're last in line as a common stockholder. You have a residual claim. What we mean is if there's anything left over, you know, then you would be entitled to that. Now, you know, as an accounting kind of a thing, we sometimes will calculate the theoretical liquidation value of a business. We don't plan on liquidating, but the theoretical liquidation value of a corporation is known as its book value. You know, but if we file bankruptcy, chapter seven, chapter 11, you know, and you say, hey, Dean, I own securities in the corporation, just file bankruptcy, where am I? In, uh, in terms of priority, as well, common stock, you're last. The way I think of it, the way Dean thinks of things is not testable. I think about it, I have the first claim on assets and the last claim in liquidation. Uh, stop order. Uh, stop orders can certainly be used to stop losses, and that's the number one use of a stop order. You know, I buy a thousand shares of Apple at 148. I tell my broker, let's place a sell stop at uh, 145. I don't want to lose approximately more than $3,000. If Apple trades at or through uh, 145, pull the trigger, turn it into a live market order, send me home. I can't tell you how many times I've regretted not putting in a sell stop. We have two versions, by the way. I'm giving you a sell stop, but we have buy stops as well. You know, if I buy the thousand shares of Apple 148, it goes to 178. I say, well, no sense going uh, backwards. Let's move our sell stop up to protect our profit. And I can also use a stop to establish a stock position. I tell my broker, I say, listen, I don't want to buy the stock until it moves. It starts moving. You know, I don't get on board the train unless it leaves the station going my way. Right now, Apple seems to kind of be stuck at 148. So why tie up 148 grand in Apple when it's stuck at 148? So I call my broker and say, I would like to put in a buy stop on Apple at 150. If Apple trades at or through 150, buy a thousand shares. And I'm using that stop order there to establish a stock position. Uh, nope, not D. Uh, D would be a market order, and that's not uh, a stop order. Now, a stop order may turn into a market order or a limit order, but that's not what a stop order is. You, you don't use a stop for immediate execution, because remember, I just told my broker, I don't want immediate execution. I want immediate execution after it trades out or through, so D. Uh, uh, this is a mirror question of something that shows up high probability on your exam in the SIE is the definition of a uh, recession. Now, I like Will Rogers' definition. Will Rogers said a recession is when your neighbor's out of work, a depression is when you're out of work. So two calendar quarters of declining GDP is a recession. And that's high probability. And then I just kind of come up with another flip of this, which is a depression. And that's six uh, calendar quarters of declining GDP. When they, we entered the pandemic, people said, you think it's gonna be like the 20s and then we're gonna have a depression? And most economists I saw said, nah, you know, six counter cores, no, let's hope not for sure, right? Uh, the only one we have that pays interest in principal monthly is GDMA. It makes sense because what your the GDMAs are mortgage pass-throughs. So as people make their payments on their mortgage, it gets passed through to the people who own proportion ownership in the pool of GDMA mortgages. It's the only one that pays monthly. Uh, quarterly would be stocks. If they pay, stocks may or may not pay, but if they do, it's typically quarterly. Bonds pay semi-annually. They pay interest semi-annually, January 1st and July 1st or February 1st and um, August 1st. And then at maturity would be an OID, also known as a zero. They don't pay you any interest along the way, but they uh, pay you at the end. So the answer here is monthly. I've been thinking about uh, coming up with a lecture just called important answer sets with no questions and just answer sets like this where you're going to encounter these answer sets and depending on the answer set will depend on the appropriate uh, you know response. 
Uh, to make its bonds more attractive, a corporation may add which of the following. So you definitely need to know that uh, warrants are long-term and exercisable above the current market price. And sometimes we add warrants as a sweetener to get people to buy the thing. So you go, Dean, as a bond, it doesn't look very attractive. I mean, that's not a very high coupon for that. But I said, well, yeah, hold on. I got some warrants attached to this thing. You know, for the next 10 years, out to the year 2031, you can buy the stock at seven. You say, well, Dean, right now it's six. I go, well, I know. Right now that doesn't make sense. But, you know, some future point with the stock at uh, 25 or 30, that would make a lot of sense. Now, the other thing you got to be able to do is contrast rights with warrants. So rights are short term. And rights are what we use when our existing shareholders to give them an opportunity to maintain their proportionate ownership. And uh, rights are exercisable below the current market price. And so you've got to be able on the test to contrast rights. Let me get a different color here. With warrants. Warrants are long-term and exercisable above. Um, what's the following investment risk is the greatest in a less than investment grade bond. So, you know, the two major risks you have in bonds are interest rate risk and credit risk. And when you buy a bond that's less than investment grade, the one they like on the test is standard and poor's. So standard and poor's triple B is investment grade less than that. We don't say in the outside of the SIE, we call it junk, but one man's junk is another man's treasure. So we don't say that on the test, but on the, you know, in the real world, that's what we would call that. Anyways, you're gonna be more exposed to credit risk in a bond that's less investment grade. A customer buys a hundred shares of XYZ at 65. Now there's a lot of ways to do options. Uh, I like to use dollars out, dollars in. And again, you know, on the SIE, you can uh, pass the SIE without doing, you know, options work. I mean, there's three or four of them. You could guess B and you could still pass the SIE. So it's up to you to decide how much work you're gonna do. Now, I would tell you that if you're coming back to take a seven, you know, if you're taking a six, who cares? Because you're done with your options after the SIE. But if you come back to a seven, there ain't three or four, there's like 20 plus. So you know, you gotta decide how much work you wanna do. Now I have two lectures in the SIE playlist. There's well, actually, there's three, but the first one is two hours. The first hour is lecture one, and that's on the introduction to options. The second lecture, lecture two, I'll probably put a, a tag in this uh, explication, is stock plus options. That's, uh, excuse me, lecture two is basic positions. Lecture three is stock plus options. So they're there for you. So that would be a three hour investment uh, if you want to go through options for your SIE. I also have some working models there for you. Uh, the six that are, I think are most likely to show up on the SIE where I go through what I'm doing now, which is kind of a T and show you how to set them up and how to attack them. So I paid 65 for the stock, dollars out. And then I established a choice to sell it at four. I'm a smart guy. Uh, I paid for the protection. So 65 for the stock, four points for the protection. Anytime I want between now and expiration in May, I can sell the stock at 65. And so why would I do that? I don't do that because I want to stick it to somebody at 65, but that would be my worst case is, you know, the break even to the strike, which is nice having a floor at 65 instead of, you know, falling down 65 slides of stairs here. So the reason I do this is to have an ability to participate in a big price increase, but not participate in a big price decline. Now, usually what happens is people get the basics and not the hedges or the hedges, not the basics. But if all I did was buy this 65 put at four, I break even at 61, I would have been bare, I'd be a speculator. But here I'm trying to hedge my stock position. A uh, bond issue with a coupon of seven. So we highly recommend the teeter-totter. I love the teeter-totter because the teeter-totter turns judgment questions into aim and shoot uh, point and click questions. And anytime I can do that, I am a big fan. So there's my coupon, that doesn't change. The issue says, we don't care who's got the bond, whoever has that bond, we're willing to, uh, you know, uh, we're going to pay them 7%. And then it tells me the yield is five. So that means the yield here, yield of maturity is what we're usually referring to there, is 5%. That's the yield to maturity. This is the nominal yield. This would be the current yield. This would be the yield to call. And so then I go, boom. And you're going to have to recognize at least once on the exam 
that's a bond trading at a premium. By the way, that means you're concerned that the bond's going to get called. You may still want the bond, but you need to know that number to make that decision in the real world because it's very likely the bond's going to get called because interest rates have gone up, causing the bond to go up. It's very likely this issuer wants to replace their high cost debt, 7% debt, with what today they could refinance at 5%. So you have much more call risk in this situation. Again, I know you're not surprised. I have a lecture. It's called Ford Bond, not James Bond. So if you want to look at the bond lecture, you can see the uh, bonds there. And actually, you can find it with the thumbnail, which is a picture of the teeter-totter. So uh, I've also explicated the FINRA test content outline for the SIE, and I talk about it there as well. The public offering price a customer pays for an open-end mutual fund. So, you know, the sales charge is the NAV plus the sales charge equals the public offering price. And so the public offering price customer pays is based on the previous offering price? No. The previous close? No. It's always based on the next computation of the NAV. That's called forward pricing. We're always doing business in a mutual fund based on the next calculation of the NAV. And whatever that next calculation is, then plus the sales charge would be the public offering price. And that's what you'd pay for that. Very testable concept. That's called forward pricing. This idea we're always doing now. On the Investment Company Act of 1940, you're required, you're required to do this uh, every uh, business day, at least once per business day. There are mutual funds who do this more often than that, but that would be the minimum. Uh, class A mutual fund, the largest expense of the fund. Now I'm kind of being a jerk here again on RTFQ. You know, what I'm trying to get you to do is bite on that the sales load is the largest single expense to a class A, but that's not to the fund. That's to the customer. I didn't ask what's the largest expense to the customer. I asked what is the largest expense to the fund? And that would be the investment advisory fee is typically the largest single expense to a mutual fund. So again, uh, here I'm just illustrating this idea of, you know, make sure you're answering the question that's being asked and not the question that you think is there. Uh, regular rate settlement on corporate bonds is, so same day would be cash settlement, very uh, much an irregular way. You know, we have on the, uh, you know, this thing called, let me put it up here, the uniform practice go. You can imagine what a mess the securities industry would be if everybody was conducting business differently. And so the Uniform Practice Code standardizes secondary trading within the securities industry. And we agree that we're gonna settle up, settlement is when ownership changes hands, T plus two, right? So that's C. Same day would be for cash settlement and that would be an irregular way to settle a trade. Very popular, for example, on December 31st, because otherwise it could be the next year. Next business day would be for govies. T plus one is govies and options. And then C is the answer here. Uh, which of the following are, uh, outcomes are possible for the writer of an uncovered or naked call? So what you're doing here is you're agreeing to sell stock you don't own. This is very, very foolish. You know, it's like picking up nickels in front of a bulldozer because all you're going to get if you're right is the premium. But boy, your loss is unlimited. You should definitely know that an uncovered naked call, your loss is unlimited. Now, this is a mirror question of what's found in the FINRA practice exam, which is a covered call. And in a covered call, you know, the loss would be limited and the profit would be limited. So uh, I just flipped this. And again, this is a mirror version of a question found in the uh, FINRA. Uh, uh, practice test. Under normal circumstances, a customer can backdate a letter of intent. So a letter of intent is where you tell the mutual fund that you intend to meet the breakpoint, the quantity discount. A breakpoint is a great thing. It's a quantity discount. And I tell them I plan on uh, fulfilling my letter of intent. And then the mutual fund says, well, since you intend to do that, we're going to let you come in at the lower sales charge. So, you know, why wouldn't you want to uh, fill out a letter of intent? Now, I would definitely know this thing is 13 months. And again, um, I'm trying to come up with the mirror questions of uh, FINRA's test, uh, uh, practice test. They have the 13 months. So I thought, well, if they've asked you the 13 months there, 
I'll ask you the back date of 90 days. Now, the customer can't be hurt by filling out the letter of intent. Because, you know, by filling out the letter of intent, you're going to be able to get additional fund shares. That's a wonderful thing. They'll just escrow those. And if you don't meet the break point, they'll just, you know, uh, you know, sell the shares in the escrow and re, re uh, backdate the account. It'll look exactly like it would look. So customers cannot be hurt by filling out a letter of intent. A FINRA member firm is willing to provide liquidity by being willing to buy at its bid and sell at its ask. We call that a market maker, a market maker. Now we're all called broker dealers, but in any one transaction, you know, we're either gonna act as an agent and charge a commission, or we're gonna be a dealer and act as a principal for a profit. And if we, uh, by the way, we won't be both in any one trade, but that means we make a markets and securities. The cooling off period is a minimum of 20 days, a minimum of 20 days. Remember that's that quiet time? I said, well, we're in the cooling off period of quiet time. I'm not allowed to comment on the prospects of the issuer. What I can do is send you the preliminary prospectus, accept an indication of interest, place a tombstone. Uh, if a brokerage firm uh, liquidates, and in a brokerage firm liquidation, which entity handles any claims made by customers? You know, uh, in the late 60s, we shut down a lot of brokerage firms and couldn't find the customer's money securities, and that was embarrassing. And we said, you know, those bankers are onto something. The bankers got that sign that made people feel warm and fuzzy, uh, believing their money at the bank. We need a sign like that. And so our sign says Securities Investor Protection Corporation. And, you know, the Securities Investor Protection Corporation covers customers for up to $500,000 of which no more than 250,000 can be cash for each account with different beneficial ownership if we liquidate the brokerage firm and we can't find your stuff. A common stockholder has as many votes for each vacancy of the board. So we're looking at three board seats, let's say, as the number of shares own multiply. So I'll just make up a number I own, uh, let's say I own 500 shares. So now it says I'm gonna multiply that and I have 1,500 votes. And that is called cumulative voting. Now, that means, you know, it'll, I'll be more protected as a minority shareholder because I can uh, put all 1,500 votes maybe on my buddy here, but then I get to vote on anything else or 750 or 750. Now, remember, I don't have to attend the board meeting to vote. You know, prior to 1934, we would have, you know, shareholder votes, uh, shareholder meetings at 11.59 p.m. Alcatraz Island, you had to be present to vote. You know, it'd be a thug on the dock and he'd ask you how you're gonna vote and if you came up with the wrong answer, you wouldn't make it to the meeting. And so you can vote your shares without attending the meeting and that's called a proxy. A proxy is your ability to vote your shares without attending the meeting. You could give your proxy to someone else if you'd like. Uh, super voting, this has been coming up on the seven. Uh, super voting, is a little different. For example, uh, Ford here recently uh, declared a 10 cent dividend and Ford has super voting. The Ford family has the class B shares. They own 71 million shares of the class B shares and they are super voting. The Ford family on the B shares gets 16 votes per share. Wow. And the class A shares only have one vote per share. That's called super voting. And so the Ford family, even though they don't control 40% of the equity of Ford, they control 40% of the votes because of their super voting shares. Uh, I don't know if you'll see that on the SIE. It has been showing up on the Series 7 and you know who knows, who knows. A Roth individual retirement account has which of the following uh, features? Senator Roth is no longer here to protect his Roth IRA, but in a Roth, you don't get that nasty letter at 72. So there are no required minimum distributions in a Roth IRA. A registered rep who wants to place an ad in social media must obtain written approval by which of the following. So boy, you can imagine your registered principal is gonna be upset if he's, you know, he sees you with some ad on Facebook or something, he doesn't know anything about it, right? So registered principal of the firm. Uh, which of the following is required of a broker dealer's anti-money laundering program? Uh, filing of the AML program with FINRA. No, the AML program is in the written supervisory procedures of the broker dealer. Conducting background checks on all employees, that's not required. You, you, know, you, you can do that if you choose to, but that's not required. 
identified to regulators the employees responsible for filing the CTRs or SARs with FinCEN? Nope. Uh, there we go. Boom. You have to uh, have, have it in your WSPs. A customer has a penny stock in her account. How often must the firm send her an account statement? Well, usually it's quarterly, but if you have a penny stock in your account, it's going to be monthly. And a penny stock is a non-NASDAQ OTC stock under five. And uh, I cleaned this up from the earlier version. You know, good news. If you, you know, if you, you know, I appreciate your viewership. And, uh, you know, if you find something that is problematic to you, just send me a, you know, I'm pretty good at uh, commenting. And somebody said, hey, Dean, I thought there were exceptions to this. And there is. And so this is take three. So I'm just getting rid of the exception so we don't have to go into uh, a further discussion because this is what they're looking for on the test. Or otherwise, it's quarterly. And uh, quarterly, we tell you if you have like a credit balance that it's available upon demand, right? So. A qualified institutional buyer of securities. This shows up. Now, I've kind of overkilled this in this practice set because uh, it's there and we know it's there. So, you know, I joke, angels weep for you if you miss something and we know it's there. So, you know, we know this 144 thing is there. And we said, what is it? It spells out what the definition of a quib is. And then remember, be careful. They also then will combine that with what's called a pipe, a private investment in a public entity done by a quib. We said what quibs are allowed to do is buy unregistered foreign and domestic securities. And they have an example where a quib is buying unregistered stock in a public company, and that's called a pipe. It doesn't have to be a quib, but that's when they tends to show up. Uh, this is G37, General Rule 37. A municipal financial professional is allowed to make a campaign if uh, she can vote, and it can't be more than 250, uh, you know, um, the FINRA version of this has per election cycle and test, Sean, but you know, here you're just on the test, you're going to have to come up with 100 for G20, which is the gift of gratuity rule we discussed earlier. By the way, FINRA has pretty much rules that are similar. So the gift of gratuity rule of FINRA is the same for the MSRB, but it's called G20. Who cares? This is G37, 250. Uh, which of the following mandates a broker dealer identify their customers with a picture ID? And that's called the Patriot Act, right? And if we can't uh, prove who you are with your picture ID, you know, what doesn't work here is a birth certificate or doesn't have a picture. But then we have to have procedures for closing accounts for people that we're not able to identify. Uh, there would be no excuse for you to miss any economics questions. I have, as I told you, two versions of economics. I uh, explicate the economics questions on the FINRA test content outline for you. I also have a lecture on economics called Money is a Giant Floating Crap Game. That's a quote from Lord John Maynard Keynes. Uh, so there'd be no reason you shouldn't be squared away on economics if you are a viewer of uh, my channel. Uh, that being said, uh, here we're asking you which one of these rates changes the most often, and that's gonna be the Fed funds. Fed funds is banks with excess reserves, lending banks with deficient reserves. Again, this is the answer set. I don't know if you'll get this particular question, but you will encounter that answer set. The uh, discount rate is fed to member banks. That's set directly by the Fed, only one set directly by the Fed. Fed funds targets, the Fed fund rates is targeted by the Fed. Prime rate is banks to its best customers, major commercial banks to its best customers. This is what, what Apple would pay, you know, uh, Bank of America to borrow money. And then broker call, I would know that broker calls banks to brokerage firms, but most importantly, that's used to finance margin accounts. You know, typically, whatever the bank charges the brokerage firm, we charge the customer a little extra. So that's called broker call. Uh, here's the other version that we talked about. You say, hey, Dean, uh, I own securities in the corporation. The corporation is liquidating Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Where am I? What priority do I have? Ah, the senior bondholders are at the front of the line. They're the most senior security in liquidation. Now, a lot of study uh, prep providers go into wages, employees, and I guess it's just overkill. And I'm just gonna take the liberty here again. Uh, I appreciate your patience. And I'm gonna fix this. And I'm gonna say security, just to be clear, I'm not talking about the IRS. I'm not talking about the employees, there we go. The spread is the difference between the market makers bid and ask. You're gonna get some kind of a question about that. And so here's my version of that type of a question. 
right, the spread. In a period of high inflation and economic expansion, the Federal Reserve is expected to take which of the following? So, you know, the Federal Reserve Board, our central bank, has a dual mandate, full employment and price equilibrium, price stability. You know, the Fed wants to make sure there's not too much money chasing too few goods. That's what inflation is. And here it says high inflation, economic expansion. So it looks like the economy is getting a little overheated here. You know, uh, one of the Fed uh, Reserve chairmen that I like said, you know, the job of the Fed is to take the punch pull away just before the uh, party gets rolling. <laughs> so, you know, the punch is spiked. That may not be a bad idea. You should have been able to get rid of this because you should definitely know that's fiscal policy. And it uh, looks like I'm going to try and slow down the economy here because I don't like inflation, right? We like price equilibrium, price stability. So uh, raise the Fed funds rate. Uh, tell banks they have to have, uh, you know, or target it, raise it by targeting that. Yeah, that seems like it might slow down the economy. Buy bonds, that's what they've been doing. Buying bonds, the bonds uh, come into the central bank, money goes out, money supply goes up. We already have too much money, so we're not going to do that one. Uh, require banks to decrease reserves. Well, they decrease the reserves, they have more money to lend. Again, money goes up. We already got too much money. Boom. Uh, which of the long stake cards last? I've, I've been uh, kind of killing this over and over again. I don't think you're going to get three. This is the third time we've seen a question like this. I think you'll definitely get one. But, you know, remember the equity holders are the, have the last claim in chapter 11. Uh, this is my flip or mirror of the FINRA test specification. You should definitely know that one of our safe harbors or exempt transactions under 33 is Reg D. So the SEC says, Dean, did you just sell brand new securities to the public without making a registration statement? I said, well, I did sell brand new securities, but I didn't sell them to the public. I sold them by invitation only, and I only extended an invitation to accredited investors, institutional investors, depending on which version I'm using, sophisticated investors. And so we definitely need to know who can participate in a Reg D is, and it meets this definition of accreditation. Now in the FINRA version uh, practice exam, by the way, all testable. So I mean, it doesn't matter Dean's version, FINRA practice test, doesn't matter. They have the $300,000 and that was for the couple on that exam. So I'm giving you the single one here, which is the 200,000. Now, the last one that would fit this would be a million dollars exclusive of your primary residence. Uh, the SEC has expanded this definition to include Series 7s and Series 65s are now considered credit investors, but only if they're in good standing. So what that means is I can't tell you how many people are out there right now thinking that they're going to pass a 7 or 65. 65 doesn't require sponsorship, and they're going to be accredited. No, good standing, the SEC says means you are affiliated with a broker dealer as a seven or affiliated with an investment advisory firm as a 65. So I wish people knew that. I can't tell you how many of them are out there thinking they're going to be accredited after they pass their exams. ABC declares a 10% stock dividend to common stockholders. If a customer owns 100 shares at 50, what is the new price? Well, again, Dean said you can just shop the answer set and you want more shares at a lower price. Now, I would definitely know that a stock dividend is not taxable. So I'm just going to adjust my basis to 45.45. Now, again, if you want to do the math, I don't know why you would, but if you want to do the math, you would take, you know, the 100 times 10%. And so I'm going to get 10 additional shares. Now, remember, so is everybody else. So there's been no effective change in my proportion ownership. So now I have 110 shares. And I paid originally for the stock $5,000. And then I would divide and I get 45, 45. But if you remember Dean telling you more shares at a lower price. I remember the only exception would be a reverse where it would be less shares at a higher price. A non-exempt issuer. So what does that mean in English? That means we're not talking about the US Treasury, we're not talking about a municipal, the US government, its agencies, municipal issuers. There are 50,000 municipal issuers who are exempt, cities, counties, states. You know, there's more. And then when you take your 65, I know you're excited, or 66, you'll have to know the whole laundry list. Those are the big ones for the SIE US government, its agencies, and municipals. Non exempt transactions. 
So that means we're not talking about reg A, we're not talking about 147, we're not talking about a reg D, we're not talking about one of those safe harbors. We're not talking about one of those safe harbors. So assuming you don't have one of those safe harbors available to you, well, then you're gonna to have to register with 33. 33 is known as the Prospectus Act. You know, 33 and 34 were companion pieces of legislation. So Congress knew when they passed, you know, 33 in December, they're gonna come back and pass 34. Sometimes you get questions right by covering up your screen. Are they asking about paper prospectuses or are they asking about people and places? Prospectus is paper, 33. People and places, 34. Uh, this is my uh, mirror of a test question that Finner asked, a buyer cover. So as a buyer, what I do is an opening purchase. You know, I showed you a T here, you know, and I did an opening purchase. And so the offset to an opening purchase is what we call a closing sale. And you will see this answer set on your exam. And again, uh, I don't know how much work you want to do to pass your SIE. But if you're coming back for a seven, that's going to be important. So the way we get out of this is doing a closing sale. And we hope that the, the closing sale is more, right? There's three things that can happen to an option contract. It can be traded. That's what we're looking at here. It can be exercised or it can expire. So that answer set's pretty important. So uh, this is a mirror uh, on the FINRA test uh, practice test. They gave you the uh, opening purchase. So I fit well, I'll give you the, the opposite of that. Uh, that answer sets there though. So let's be clear. I'm not trying to prep you to pass the FINRA practice test. I mean, you know, I would save that maybe as an inventory. The other thing I get a little concerned about too, I'd like to comment on is that uh, I'm not doing these explications. These are not like a mastery at Kaplan or a green light at STC. My explications of practice exams or to share a uh, practice drill and rehearse current test issues. So uh, every once I get nervous when somebody say, hey Dean, I just got a 90 on or 80 on or 60 or whatever. On your practice exam, I'm ready to go. I go, whoa, whoa, slow down a little bit. Slow your roll there, my friend. Uh, you know, that's not what these are designed, these explications are about. So, you know, these are about sharing, practice drilling, rehearsing, current test topics, and uh, use them accordingly, use them accordingly. Maybe someday I'll do that, you know, write up, uh, you know, something that is a, uh, you know, a, an intellectual inventory that gives you an idea of, you know, where you're at in terms of passing the test. A uh, stock that has been subsequently purchased by the issuing corporation is known as treasury stock. You know, Microsoft has uh, announced that they're going to buy $60 billion of their stock. So they either can do that by a tender to their existing shareholders. They can do it in this, just go on the secondary market and do it. And it's called treasury stock. Treasury stock is associated with mature, stable businesses that are generating more cash than they need. And there are two things I would know about this treasury stock. Treasury stock has no voting, no voting rights. I got a new computer coming. I've been kind of upset because my computer, for some reason, my annotation tools on my screen is acting up. So, uh, you know, good news, I got it replaced on its way, but until then we just have to deal with it. And it pays no dividends. Uh, right now, fiscal policy test question is government spending and taxation, and they are proposing a 1% surtax on uh, treasury stock buyback shares that, so 1% of 60 billion uh, charge Microsoft that as a, uh, a tax. Woo, you know, they, I was reading how much they think that might bring in to pay for the, uh, you know, the, the stuff they wanna do. Uh, call risk, so, you know, one of the risks you have when interest rates go down is that the issuer wants to call the bond away from you. They wanna replace the bond you're holding where they're paying a high interest rate with something that's a lower interest rate. Now, there are a couple of bonds where you don't have any call risk. You don't have call risk and zeros. Zeros are not callable. And treasury notes and treasury bonds are not callable. But almost every other bond is going to be callable and there'll be a call protection period. How long before they can call it? And then is there a prepayment penalty, if you will? And so that's associated with a falling interest rate environment, a falling interest rate environment. Uh, which of the following represents a, the effect of a reverse, but this is embarrassing. You know, GE had their stock fall so far that they said, man, this is not respectable any longer. You know, for, and you know, the easy way out of this 
you know, if, not Tesla, but if your stock trades below a buck for more than 100 days consecutively, you can get booted from the New York Stock Exchange. So one easy fix would be we're an 80 cent stock, we do a 10 for one reverse, and now we're an $8 stock. <laughs> so that's the whole point of doing a reverse split is to get the common stock price up to a more respectable level. Now, remember here, you would end up with having less shares at a higher price. That's the whole point of this enterprise. Usually not good news because they're doing a reverse split. That's, it's, it's typically because there's the market has, you know, they've made some bad decisions, let's put it that way. And then remember, if I asked you about cost base, remember whether it's a forward split, reverse split, split, stock dividends are not taxable. Cash dividends are taxable, but not, not stock dividends. Um, I don't know if I have another question here about cash dividends, but make sure you understand cash dividends are taxable. And then, you know, they're either going to be taxed at the same rate as your ordinary income, or if it's a qualified cash dividend, you've had it 30, 60, 90 days before you'll be a lower rate. I think I might have a question on that coming, but you know, if I don't, you know, if you're taking notes, just make that note and fix it. Okay. I'll make sure I read my own answer set. Sometimes I read my own answer set. You know, I would amend RTFQ with RTFA. You not only read the full question, read the full answer set as well. All right, so I'm a market maker and I posed a quote of 15, 15, 15. So what that means in English is I'm willing to buy this stock into my inventory at 15 and I'm willing to sell this out of my inventory at 15, 15. And then 30 by 10 is the size of my quote. And so that's 30 round lots. A round lot is 100 shares. So right now as a market maker, I'm saying I'll buy 3,000 shares into my inventory at 15. I'll sell 1,000 shares out of my inventory at 15.15. So which actions is the market maker willing to take? I'm willing to sell 3,000 shares. No, I'm not willing to sell 3,000 shares at 15. You know, I sell at my ask. I sell at my ask. That's the high price. From the market maker's perspective, so that's not right. I'm willing to buy 3,000 shares at 15 and I'm willing to sell, yep, yeah, there we go. Ding, 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 ding. That's what I'm willing to do. Now, if, remember, if I'm not willing to do that, then you know I'm backing away, right? Because I'm feeling down on my quote. Uh, buy 30,000 shares at 15, yep. And sell 10,000, nope, I didn't say I'd do that. Sell 100 shares at 15, nope, so that's B. When a broker dealer charges a markup or a markdown in a securities transaction, again, they're acting as a market maker. Which of the following is true of a bond that has been refunded or pre-refunded? Intellectually, that's the same thing. So what that means is you're holding a bond right now that has not passed its call protection period. And I call you as your broker and I say, hey, you know the bond you're holding? You say, Mandy, I love the bond. Interest rates have gone down. The bond I'm holding has gone up. They can't call it from me even if they wanted to. I said, that's true, but they've actually sold some new bonds, put the money in an escrow account so they can uh, you know, call the bond once it passes this call protection period. You say, well, great, Dean, they owe the money, they got the money, so you know, AAA. I go, yeah, but you know, the problem is you're not gonna receive, you're not gonna receive the yield of maturity. You know, right now the bond is gonna get called and you're going to receive yield to call and the yield to call is gonna be lower than the yield of maturity. Now, another way to say that, if the yield of maturity is higher. Now, this is a more you know, obtuse way I've got at answering this question. But you know, when you buy a bond at a premium, and we were should have been able to figure out this bond is at a premium because the old bond, right? Because if the old bond is still out there and they've done this operation where they've sold new bonds, got an escrow account, that's what refunded, pre-refunded means. Then the bond's gonna get called and you're gonna end up with a lower yield than yield of maturity. Uh, who affects the record records changes of ownership of corporation for trades that take place in the secondary market? That would be the transfer agent, the transfer agent, right? They're the ones who are going to, you know, issue a new certificate if it's mutilated and needs to be authenticated, all that kind of stuff. Uh, 90 day restriction on credit. So remember a free ride is when a customer buys and sells without paying for the buy. And when you take a free ride, what we do is we put you on a 90 day restriction. Now that doesn't mean we're not gonna trade with you. That means you have no credit privileges. You know, you're gonna pay, have to pay before we execute the buy. 
or if you're selling, you have to deliver the security. So what got you in that predicament was taking the free ride. Now, the free ride is when a customer buys and sells without paying for the buy. So we talked about a tender, right? A tender offer. I call you as a broker and I say, hey, listen, Disney has made a tender for your Fox stock. They're offering to exchange you X number of shares as Disney for the shares you're presently holding in Fox. They're making a tender. Or I say, hey, uh, Berkshire Hathaway is making a tender for its own stock. As a shareholder, Berkshire Hathaway is offering to buy your Berkshire Hathaway shares from you as treasury stock. They decide not to go in the secondary market that way. It's still secondary transaction, but go directly to the shareholders see if anybody's out there wants to sell their shares. And you have 20 days to decide whether or not you want to accept Disney's tender or accept Berkshire Hathaway's tender or reject it. At the time of issuance, which of the following securities has the shortest period to expiration? Remember the rights test question are short-term exercisable below the current market price. You know, in fact, I think, I think what I will do here, uh, LEAP is a uh, option contract, long-term equity appreciation or anticipation potential securities, who cares? But what that is, is a uh, option that has a two uh, year um, technically 39 months to expiration in practice, 30 months, but an incredibly long time. And then I'm just going to change this here. And the reason I'm changing that is because convertible bonds, you should know that when issued, the conversion price is going to be above whatever the current market price is. And warrants, you should know that. And then leaps just depends, but it's definitely rights here. So I'm just clean. Whoa. Why did that? Uh, let me get my thing out of here. Looks like Dean has done something. There we go. Boom. Uh, I did the flip of this. So again, the FINRA test specification, again, again, I'm not trying to prepare you for FINRA's test practice test. What I'm trying to do is give you another practice test, but I tried and did look at that exam to kind of mirror or flip it and give you different questions on there. When I explicate the uh, practice uh, exam, for FINRA, what I do is tell you about wrong answers and why they're wrong. And here I'm kind of doing the same thing with these answer sets. I'm showing you some different answer sets. And so it would be D. You know, if this was a corporate or muni bond, it would be A, but it could be any. It's, it's not so much that it happens to be D this time. It's, you know, that's, there's nothing that's going to be this and there's nothing that's going to be this, right? So it's going to be either A for corporates or munis or D for guvies. Uh, your U4, I don't know where you're at in your process here. Uh, maybe you haven't filled out the U4 yet and you're just doing the SIE and maybe you're just doing that to, for whatever you're a college student and you want to show that you're motivated and get a job in the securities industry. But when you fill out a U4, there's a lot of questions they ask you and not testable, but if you can answer every question, no. In the business, we call that a clean U4. If you have a yes answer in the business, we call that a dirty U4. You know, and there's some answers that are dirtier than others. I mean, there's, you know, three yes answers that would be reasons for statutory disqualification. I mean, you know, you can't be a broker and the SEC and FINRA don't have to tell you why. You know, conviction of a felony within the last 10 years. Have you ever been denied suspended or revoked registration in the past? I call this the don't we know you from somewhere rule. Uh, a misdemeanor involving embezzlement money securities. Now, the other ones you would have to explain. They still might not deny your registration, but at least they'd give you an explanation. But anyways, if you have a U4 and something that was a no answer now has become a yes answer, 30 days to amend that U4 for the new uh, yes answer, whatever that yes is. Uh, which of the following allows banks to share customer information with FinCEN? I would know that that's the Bank Secrecy Act, the Bank Secrecy Act. The maximum period of time. So we're not talking about I'm, taking my IRA and I'm moving it from cust custodian A to custodian B. No, I'm calling and saying next week, next Thursday, I'm going to come in. I want you to liquidate all my investments. I want you to have a cashier's check ready for me and I'm going to take physical possession. Well, that's what I do. I have 60 days to get that back into the appropriate uh, place. Now the 15 calendar days would remember 
uh, could have been a right answer to getting the option agreement back perhaps, right? But again, the test, the distractors, the wrong answers could have been right answers to different things. Okay, well, uh, listen. Um, I hope uh, that you found uh, this version. Maybe you can write and do both versions of this. I'm going to put this up. I'm going to delete the other version. I came in way over uh, what I came in on the first one, but I told you that was the point. I kind of said, man, I got in a hurry. I try not to do that, but every once in a while, I'm trying to get content out there and I get a little ahead of myself. And I felt like I did that in the last explication. So uh, here's the latest version. Uh, this will be up there. Like, uh, subscribe, uh, share the channel. Uh, I started the channel about a year ago. We're coming up at 150,000 views. Uh, we're closing in on 3,000 uh, subscribers. So uh, I appreciate your support. Uh, the next thing I'll probably be doing is uh, getting some more 24 content up, 9, 10 content. And I'm working on a practice exam four on the seven. So that'll be there if you're taking the seven. And so that's kind of the game plan. So again, appreciate all your support. I hope you find these uh, helpful. And uh, again, we'll do around the horn. So once I get done with other stuff, I'll come back and there'll be a practice to uh, test two at some point. All right. Thank you.